Hello, good morning. Calling all speakers to please come to the podium. Shaka, Claudio, anyone else in the room who should be on the stage. Uh, we'll be starting shortly at about 10.30. I'd also, um, because we're quite a large room and it's a, a strange configuration, um, I'd ask everyone to come close to the front. We want to make this a, an engaging discussion and have you be part of the conversation. Uh, so please come come closer to the front of the room and um, maybe look towards the speakers if you twist your chairs a little bit. Thanks.
Hello, good morning. Everyone hear me? Yes. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this morning on day four. Uh, imagine uh, many of you are, are tired after a long week and a long APC party last night. Um, <laughs> but thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rachel Pollack. Uh, I am an associate program specialist at UNESCO in communication and information. And uh, for many years, I uh, worked on a, a series of reports called World Trends in Freedom of Expression and Media Development. Um, you'll find them uh, scattered along the tables uh, by our friend uh, Chris Buckridge from Ripen CC, who will also be our super special reporter <laughs> of this session <laughs> um, and be taking notes and give a, a summary at the end. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of our, our, our panel before we get started, uh, we'll start with a short uh, teaser uh, video uh, about the report. Then we'll hear opening remarks from Anna Karafelt from CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, which has uh, very generously supported this project. Uh, we'll next have a presentation uh, by my colleague Guillerme Canella from the UNESCO office in Multivideo who will present the key findings from the World Trends Report. After that, we will have uh, an interactive uh, discussion with, uh, we have subject matter experts on each of the, uh, the thematic areas within the World Trends Report. And so, um, speaking on media freedom, we have uh, Florence, and you just told me how to say your last name, I've forgotten already. <laughs> Poznanski. Poznanski. My last name is Pollock. I should know Pozanski, but uh, anyway, um, Florence uh, Pozanski from uh, Internet Without Borders, uh, Brazil chapter. Uh, then speaking on media pluralism, we will have Claudia Lucena, who is a law professor um, based in, in Brazil, but uh, traveling around the world uh, talking about algorithms and very interesting things. Um, speaking on media independence, we have Peter Meisek, uh, from Access Now. Uh, we were going to have a speaker on the safety of journalists and, and she wasn't able to make it. So um, if there are any journalists in the room or people working on media development, feel free to jump in the conversation um, then and I'll also say, say a few things about that topic. Uh, we'll have as cross-cutting themes, um, looking at the gender equality dimensions uh, of freedom of expression and media development. Uh, we have uh, Bishaka Datta, hopefully you have your last name right, uh, from Point of View in, in India. And then our last uh, subject matter expert will be Thomas Schneider from Ofcom, one of the organizers uh, of this week's event, um, who will speak about uh, overall trends in global internet governance and the impact that they have on, uh, on freedom of expression and media development. Um, so with that, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Vimeo, it's not me too, but to short, show a short video and let's hope the, the audio works. Thanks.
Great, so uh, World Trends and Freedom of Expression and Media Development uh, out at a theater near you. <laughs> um, now I will give the microphone to uh, my colleague, Guillermo Canelo. Ah, apologies. Yes, I switched, uh, switched the order. Uh, excuse me, for, to Anna Karafelt uh, from CETA, uh, who will give us some, some opening remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Rachel uh, and uh, UNESCO for, for convening this conversation and for this extremely important report, which we are very proud to, to partner with you on. Um, our support uh, to the report uh, goes back to the, uh, to the benchmarking uh, report uh, 2014, I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Uh, and we find it really important to support this initiative as we see that the monitoring and of the development and trends both offline and online is, is crucial to our work. It, it helps us see the bigger picture and identify challenges and also form, form strategies um, ahead. I think that the, the many forms of, of crackdowns identified in the report makes it really uh, evident that we need a comprehensive uh, approach and strategies to, to counter this development. And I think one such example is uh, is the dramatic increase of shutdowns. It has enormous consequences on human rights and on democracies and on, on developments at large. Uh, it hinders access to information and freedom of expression and it's a severe threat to an open, um, accessible and human rights based internet. <coughs> But with this uh, gloomy development, it's also very encouraging to see the, the many initiatives uh, to, to counter the, the, the neg negative trajectory on, on, on shutdowns, uh, both the human rights councils uh, condemning uh, shutdowns, but also the many civil society initiatives like, uh, like the Keep It On campaign, for example, and also just uh, the, the attention that it's been given uh, under that, uh, during the IGF as well. I think that with, with so many threats to, to combat and at so many levels, now maybe more than ever, it's, it's really important with joint efforts and a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, and we just wanna, just wanna applaud uh, UNESCO for, for ta taking such a lead in the UN family in terms of really utilizing a, a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, and and in, this, in that spirit, I, I really look forward to, to this conversation and to the ones to come as well. So thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, and again, would just like to express our, our deep gratitude and appreciation for all the support you have given over the years um, to the World Trends series um, and to our work more generally on freedom of expression and the safety of journalists. Um, maybe to give just a little bit of background before we move to Guillermo's uh, presentation on the World Trends report, that this started uh, through a request from our uh, 195 UNESCO member states in 2011, uh, there was a resolution that was a uh, draft resolution introduced by Sweden and about 20 other countries um, asking UNESCO to monitor trends in press freedom and the safety of journalists and to report on them uh, to the General Conference. And so this request turned into uh, what became the, the World Trends Report. Um, which I believe, as, as my colleague Guillermo will, will explain, uh, is based on uh, our conception of press freedom derived from the Windhoek Declaration from 1991, which is, sees press freedom as media freedom, media pluralism, media independence, and the, and the safety of journalists. Um, so that's the prism that we've, we've used to, to analyze trends, and we had our first report in 2014, uh, second report in 2015 look at, that looked at selected digital trends, uh, digital era trends, and then this is our, our 17 report, uh, of which we will discuss the key findings. Um, I also would like to introduce uh, our remote moderator, uh, Olga, and you'll have to help me with your last name also. Kiriluk. Olga Kiriluk uh, from Ukraine, who is the co-founder of Digital Rights Defenders? Digital Defense Partners, thank you. I should have had the notes in front of me. Um, and uh, she is keeping track of our uh, remote moderated chat room, uh, so uh, we'll be asking her also if there are, if there are questions and comments. Uh, remote participants, um, you're not here physically in the room, but you're very much uh, welcome and um, we're eager to, ha to have your, 
your inputs in the conversation. Uh, I'd also like to say a quick hello to some of my colleagues back at UNESCO headquarters who I believe are watching the live stream, especially Oscar Castellanos, who's done a tremendous uh, work with the, especially with the design, the videos we just saw. So uh, before I forget, shout out to Oscar. Uh, now, Guillerme, let you. Thanks a lot, good morning to all. I was wondering how many of you came to this session because of the title, from fake news to internet shutdowns. And as you heard from Rachel, this is not exactly what we are going to discuss here, so I hope this is not considered a fake news for you uh, who attended this session because there was this very sexy title my colleagues invented for <laughs> grabbing more audience to this session. Uh, but at the end of the day, the idea here is to present the, the main results of this big effort. I think you all can um, see how uh, difficult it is for an international organization like UNESCO to produce a report with this kind of title, no? World Trends on Freedom of Expression and Media Development. Uh, we are talking about a huge uh, amount of options to decide what we can say about world trends on those topics. Um, and, uh, but uh, this is part of our role as an institution who also, needs to, who also needs to serve our member states as a laboratory of ideas. So the entire conception of this World Trend Report uh, upon the request of our member states is precisely uh, to offer to the discussion uh, in our different uh, governing bodies uh, substantial inputs uh, to uh, identify those trends, those challenges, things that uh, are moving forward, but also things that are moving backwards. So this is uh, the heart of the, the publication of the World Trends Report. And, and by our surprise, uh, it's, it's kind of an editorial success considering UNESCO or United Nations publications. Uh, since we launched the first uh, edition in 2014, I looked at uh, the figures this morning, uh, we have 75,000 downloads uh, of the, the reports, the three reports we have already launched in different language. So uh, uh, this shows that uh, different constituencies around the world uh, are duly interested in what we are saying in those different reports. And at least from my experience being a uh, regional advisor for UNESCO in the Latin American region, uh, the Latin American governments uh, are using the data and the information we are publishing in these publications uh, to reshape policy, to further discuss policy, uh, even to antagonize with us saying we are not right and that's also the purpose of this kind of publications. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, to move forward quickly on the key findings, since I don't know who is helping me with that. Um, so, uh, as, as Rachel has already uh, underlined, uh, and I, I was saying in the beginning, it's, it's quite difficult to produce a report with this very big title, World Trends uh, on, on Freedom of Expression and Media Development, so the decision was to select the key issues that were agreed in the Vinduk Declaration on our understanding uh, of, this, of this very complex element under the Article 19 of the uh, human Rights com uh, Declaration. So we are talking about media freedom, we are talking about media pluralism, we are talking about media independence, and uh, we are talking about journalist safety because this, of course, the journalist safety uh, is, is hugely important for the other three. And as a, as a cross-cutting element, we are talking about gender uh, sensitiveness in, in, in all those areas. Next, please. And, and since we are a, a, a UN organization, we love to create new acronyms, um, allegedly to facilitate your lives, and not always we are successful in that. So we are now talking about this idea of FISH, so freedom, independence, safety, and since uh, it didn't work with the P of pluralism, we invented having a plurality of media choices to work with the, ac the acronym. Uh, but this is the idea, how we make all those concepts, those areas, those pillars to work better, how we enhance the positive trends, we foster the positive trends, and we find tools, uh, policies, regulations, cooperations, um, activities, programs, whatever you want uh, to revert uh, negative trends or movements backwards. Next, please. 
So you will see in all those different uh, infographics uh, in the next slides, uh, this uh, ambiguous movement in many of those uh, concepts I just mentioned, freedom, uh, independence, plurality, safety of journalists, uh, we have good trends, positive trends, and when we say good and positive in, in the case of UNESCO, it's those that are in line with international standards of freedom of expression, uh, but we also have uh, negative trends in every single area that we have uh, researched for, for, this re for this report. So uh, on the bright side of things, uh, we had in the last 20 years, but this is a growing trend, fortunately, uh, an amazing explosion of freedom of information laws uh, in the entire planet. Uh, so for you to have an idea, in 1989, which in historical terms is yesterday, we had only 12 countries with freedom of information laws in the entire planet. And this report is showing that we ha now have 112 countries with freedom of information laws. Still 80 more to go, but it's quite impressive that in a period of less than 30 years, we have grown so much in countries approving regulation uh, regarding freedom of information. And of course, the next challenge, as you can imagine, is how to implement well those very same laws, because approving a law is, is just the first step. But uh, we, have, we do have negative trends in the area of media freedom, uh, including the continual growing of uh, restrictions, uh, legal restrictions, and as we're saying in the graphic, uh, an, an, an increasing in the number of reported shutdowns uh, that of course affected very seriously media freedom in many parts of the world. Um, so then, and later we finishing one, what we are doing to trying to help our member states to cope with those different challenges. So next, please. In the area of independence, as you can see, uh, we also have interesting positive trends uh, in terms of um, uh, we are researching different and very interesting and creative ways of self-regulation, which is something UNESCO uh, has always stimulated, particularly when it regards to content. So we do stimulate uh, the different media and the different platforms uh, to create and to put in place um, new forms and old forms of self-regulation uh, to avoid to be regulated. Um, but we also have problems uh, in terms uh, of particularly a, a, a symbolic in terms of uh, the discourse of main political figures in uh, more and more criticizing the media um, and as a relevant player for the society. And as you can imagine, this is really dangerous. No? Uh, so uh, this uh, antagonization with the media as an institution for democracy, and, and I must say for rule of law in general, uh, this is something that we are concerned about. That's why, for instance, the next World Press Freedom Day will join these two discussions freedom of expression, press freedom, and the protection and fostering of rule of law. Uh, and also we have researched an increased dependence of many media uh, platforms on government and corporate subsidies to exist. And of course this has impacts in, in independence in many countries of the world, particularly in Latin America, uh, the so-called governmental advertisement. It's a very serious issue, uh, creating problems for media independence. And so we are, this is one of the things you will see also in the regional chapters that will be launched quite soon, I imagine. So the next one is about safety of journalists. Um, unfortunately, this is also a problem that uh, it's, it's an old uh, problem of freedom of expression and press freedom that keep, keeps going. Uh, you, you can see that there is no single week we don't need to launch a, a, a combination of another killing. Um, so the time of this, the time this, this report is covering, we have reported 530 and journalists killed in this period of 2012 and 2016 with a huge extra issue that uh, feeds back the cycle of violence that is impunity. Of the, uh, every 10 cases, nine are not uh, going to a final process in the justice and legal system uh, 
bringing the perpetrators uh, to justice. So this is a huge element of uh, feeding back the cycle of violence. But on the positive side, uh, we have a strong commitment of many, many member states with the UN Plan of Action uh, on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity. And we are watching a growing number of member states reporting back to UNESCO what's going on on the investigations um, uh, on the crimes against journalists. And we are also seeing an interesting trend uh, in, in different parts of the world, but in Latin America in particular, that is the media and the journalists themselves engaging in new investigative reporting on the crimes against their colleagues. So uh, Bragi in Brazil is doing a very interesting work on that. Uh, the Congress of Latin, uh, Investigative Journalists in Latin America is starting a new project called How to Investigate the Crimes Against the Investigators, which I think we are, all think it's an interesting trend uh, trying to, to cope and shed light to this kind of this very, very important issue. Next one. So on, on the pluralism, uh, we also, again, talking about good and, 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 and problematic trends. Uh, obviously, we have an amazing explosion of contents and uh, different contents, plural content, diverse content and voices, uh, particularly due to the, to the advance of internet. Uh, but we also have another important issue that is the crisis on many uh, so-called traditional media with decreasing circulation uh, of newspapers all over the world uh, with a very few exceptions. Um, and on the gender-based uh, area, we still watch a, a, a significant low number of women in key positions uh, in, in different media outlets. And finally, um, Again, just uh, remembering the areas we have covered, freedom, independence, safety, and pluralism. So those are um, uh, the things we want to highlight in terms of those reports. And it's interesting because now that we have a series, we can compare, uh, as, as Anna said, from the benchmarking of 2014, although it, those who follow UNESCO for more years, uh, we had back then in other, in other decades of our history, a similar trend report, particularly for press. So there are some possible uh, comparisons with uh, those uh, years uh, back then as well, which could be interesting for PhD students and his historians of the medium. Uh, then we also must say that we have good trends, we have bad trends, and we have some ambiguities that it's part of this discussion and of this role of being a laboratory of ideas. Um, and so the, 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 the main conclusions here from our side is that we need to keep protecting and promoting those elements, the fishing elements, so freedom, independence, safety of journalism, and, and pluralism. Uh, this is quite central for the 2030 agenda. So uh, what, is, what is being s uh, said in the SDG 16 is that access to information in the free media is quite central to achieve the other 16 uh, goals that are, are, are in the agenda. Uh, we have a huge opportunity in 2019. Uh, the SDG 16 will be the key, ta the key SDG being discussed, one of the key SDGs being discussed in the high level political forum in New York. And I think this community should be prepared to offer uh, important elements to member states and, and to that discussion. Um, and we want to strongly encourage you to use uh, this document to share the discussions, to organize national debates about those trends uh, and other elements you might have from, from your organizations. And to finalize, I mean, what we are doing uh, very briefly to to, to help our member states and our other stakeholders with this. So one, as you, many of you have heard, is to uh, intensify the discussion around this uh, concept of internet universality, rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholderism. Many of the, pan the panelists will talk about different aspects of this, uh, particularly uh, investing in the production of a new set of indicators to measure this concept of internet universality. We are strengthening uh, our cooperation with other UN agencies and other international partners for the, the serious implementation of the UN Plan of Action on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity. And we are launching specific programs for uh, three important players uh, in, in this area. One is judges, 
Uh, we have a massive program with judges in Latin America and Africa now, more than 9,000 judges, prosecutors already trained, and we will keep with this program in the near future. We are now discussing a new program for regulators and for police forces in different parts of the world. All those three players are quite relevant for uh, coping with di different areas of those trends I have just underlined. I hope this was useful, and I hope our panelists can also comment on different aspects of those trends we have identified, uh, either to say they, they think those trends are correct or we completely uh, got that wrong and we need to do some sort of a right to a reply, not a right to forget, but a right to a reply on what we just said. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Guillerme, for that very comprehensive uh, overview and presentation. I'll just say, um, on Guillerme's uh, defense, he was not the one <laughs> who came up with the fish and the slides, uh, positive get the positive trends to trendy now, uh, save the SDG alarm system. If you know our director, Guy Berger, you may know he's a man who loves his puns. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and just to add also, I think, uh, I hope the title was not misleading or, or uh, fake news, fake news. Uh, the goal also, I, I think it's, it's very important and helpful that Guillerme gave an overview of the overall trends, including both uh, traditional media and new media or internet related trends, because it is an important interplay and you can't understand the, the media ecosystem without looking at both sides. Um, this session will focus specifically on, on the digital trend, so we, we're not going to ask uh, the panelists to, to comment on every issue that was raised, although all of them could probably have a, a session on their own. Um, so uh, I think we will, we will address the topics of uh, so-called fake news and, and internet shutdowns. Um, on the term fake, that, there is an issue that you may have heard um, our Assistant Director General Frank LaRue uh, say in some of the sessions earlier this week that um, that was the term fake use, fake news is what has been used in a lot of conversations and it, uh, especially last spring when uh, we submitted this workshop proposal and the title, that was, that was the term uh, of the day, I'll say. Um, but I think now um, the discussion uh, on Tuesday at the high level session on democracy and public trust um, showed that actually uh, it's important to differentiate types of fake news, that we have um, disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation is, is what they called it. And, and there was a briefing note prepared by uh, the Diplo Foundation that, that I would really highly recommend uh, you read. It was, it was very well done. Um, so with that, uh, and, and, and again, uh, uh, ADG LaRue's point is that um, with the term fake news, it's a, it's a contradiction because they can't, if it's fake, then it's not news and it's, it's used as a way to discredit journalists and journalism. And so we prefer the term um, disinformation or when we say so-called so fake news uh, in scare quotes. So uh, just to clarify that. Um, okay, so let's now move to our, our first speaker, uh, Florence uh, from Internet Without Borders. Um, you have done a lot of work, uh, your organization has done a lot of work to raise awareness about internet shutdowns, uh, together with Access Now and, uh, and other partners. Could, could you tell me, uh, in your view, um, why, is this, why is this a major challenge? What are the trends uh, in restrictions, in shutdowns, uh, in, in your region where you work, in, in Latin America, and also globally? Yes, uh, thank you, Rachel. Actually, uh, I'm, uh, responsible of the head of, of um, the desk of Brazilian uh, Internet Without Border, but uh, the first com uh, invite has been made to Julie Owono, who is um, responsible to the, um, the African desk, and so we, we factor that I will talk a little bit more about uh, the Keeping On campaign in Africa, even if in uh, Brazil we are a member of a uh, global organization, uh, coalition, who's called uh, Forum Nacional pela Democratização da Comunicação, National Forum from the Democratization of the Communication. And uh, we also do a big campaign called uh, Never uh, Stop to Never Shut Down, uh, where, where, where we also make a big monitoration of the the violation uh, to freedom of expression. But uh, today I will talk a little bit more about uh, the Keep It On campaign. And I think uh, what is very uh, important, maybe two very important things, I have also other data here that I could 
I could give is firstly that uh, internet shutdown is not affecting just journalists or just communicators. When we think and when we talk about right to communication, we're just not talking about people who are making information, who are producing news. We are talking about the entire of the society, people who are rece receiving information, people who are citizens who need to, to communicate and to think in order to, to uh, interact in the society. And we're also talking about economy, uh, about all the services of our country. And uh, that's why thinking about uh, internet shutdown in a global way is so uh, important. Second thing is that, and I think it's also the big um, value of this campaign, uh, keep it on, is that uh, internet shutdown always happen in an isolated way. Uh, most of the times, maybe for the shutdown who are less uh, impersonating, uh, punctually, um, people are not organized, was not organized to, to denounce, and in some case, uh, this shutdown can be understand like a mistake or like something that is not int intentionally. And uh, the, the existence of a campaign, a national, uh, international campaign, where all the cases can be related and reported and unified gives always more uh, force to the people to get denouncing. And that's very interesting when we see the data uh, uh, in, in 2014 and 15, uh, the, the Keep It On campaign related 18 cases and uh, that had totally increased in, tw in uh, 2016 when we, we reported 56 cases and in, two, in 2017, it's not ended, but we have already 77 cases. So we see, it, I, I don't, I'm not sure that it's, it's, um, it is uh, 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 showing that it, it was a, uh, cases in uh, 20, uh, for, uh, 2014, but it shows that with the force of uh, such a campaign, the cases are always related and it's not, it's not anymore an isolated cases, but it gets uh, a global phenomenon that we are able to fight. Um, maybe I can give some example about uh, Cameroon, or it's just a... Uh, uh, well, actually, at this stage, we want to have just a very short three-minute okay. uh, and then once we will come back in the discussion and then Great. we can come into, <laughs> into individual examples. Um, i just like to say also that we the statistics that we cite in the World Trends Report on internet shutdowns are from the work done by the Keep It On Coalition and Access Now. Uh, and so um, the, this nice infographic is, is, is using your data and thank you for, for <laughs> your important work. Um, now we'll move on to uh, media pluralism and hear from Claudio. Uh, could you tell us, in your view, what is the most uh, striking trend happening uh, in the digital sphere that affects media pluralism? I have a feeling it might be related to algorithms, but take it away. <laughs> Probably not the way. <laughs> good morning, Rachel, fellow panelists. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your presence. Uh, I would really like to thank Rachel for the opportunities in an open plural that she has extended to me along this year, not to share the space, not only to share the space here with you, but to get in touch with this impressive material that is produced and tackles so many elements for us to understand the uh, challenges of, of uh, our time. Uh, the track of algorithms, the, of automation more broadly, and algorithm accountability and in artificial intelligence have dominated my, my schedule since the IGF Guadalajara. When I started to work on a project that tries to tackle exactly building a framework for dealing with situations where autonomous system in systems incorporate some level of coerciveness, that is to say, automation of law enforcement. Uh, algorithmic governance is covered in your report, specifically in media pluralism, but as you, as you might understand also, the report has cross-cutting issues. It has to do with safety, and it has clear connection also with both uh, independence and freedom. So because of my, this current study, I've recently been having an opportunity to share ideas with many friends in many different areas about the implications of these technologies. 
They were specialists in the area or and somehow interested also in how algorithms can impact their objects of study. And in this interaction, I have spotted what might be an interesting uh, trend, not yet fully developed or structured, but I think that's what an IGF is also about. Every time automation is, is deployed in an area, there's a trade-off in rights. Let me give you examples. When we deploy them in driving and in transportation, there is the efficiency for, for, for the human advantage, which we, which we trade off or have to trade off for security. When you're talking about natural processing or la of language, for example, it is also about expanding the capabilities of written language at the expense of precision. Even in law enforcement, which is a more delicate issue, there's the issue of public, sec public security also, because it's not only life that went digital, it's also crime. So this tension is justified between cryptographers, activists, and law enforcement every time. Uh, we have a, a very interesting panel here about extortion and the possibilities of, of using automated tools to prevent and to fight sextortion. But when we automate the creation of content, or to use an expression in English that might be a little, a little bit clearer, when we interfere with the information that people see and access, be it through more active showing or hiding, or be it through just ranking, what is the trade-off? User experience. Because I see user experience as keeping the user, uh, highlighting audience, and not necessarily enhancing experience. Incorporating AI tools in activities to explore opportunities is fine, but technology so solutionism is not. Ask my fellow here, uh, Emilia, who the fear that the policies that uh, propose to incorporate and automated control of content to take down uh, content in, in uh, intellectual property and the fears that they cause for the freedom of expression. Ask pioneers of AI if the technology is ready and mature for everything. So let me leave you for this first minute here with a, one reflection and a question. What if there is no such thing as fake news, which is a tentative concept that dominated the, the, the IGF? Uh, what if, I'll, I'll leave you, and don't get me wrong, alternative facts here. Uh, there is negative manipulation of information. It has always been a problem, and it's an, off, and it's an offline problem. It has been, been scaled in the digital realm. Those, there are people who want to control and manipulate that information. There has always been. They have faced two uh, very uh, interesting difficulties along the world. First, it's operationally difficult to manipulate that information. Second, it, it takes also a lot of effort. It's a costly operation uh, anyway. Now, social media has completely altered the way people access content. It might be that these people have spotted this opportunity and finally overcome these two obstacles. They can scale, now they can scale, and it's less costly. It's a much, more, uh, it's a much cheaper operation. It's not anyone's fault. It's not any, anyone who is in good faith's fault. But it's a trend. It's there. It's not as sexy as Guilherme has pointed out. It's more difficult to explain. It wouldn't probably have attracted that much, uh, much, much uh, attention. But this might be a better diagnostics. And uh, with poor diagnostics, we can even say if there is a problem, say finding a good solution. And the question I'd like to leave for this time is, is it financially viable for us to have business models of content creation in these platforms that do not interfere with how people see content? Because the answer to that question, and I suspect it is no, there is no viable financial model. If the answer is no, we should probably ask, ask why. I'll leave it here, Rachel, and then we take it back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Claudio, for these very uh, interesting and thought-provoking comments and, and questions that you raise. Um, I think that, that leaves a lot of uh, rich material for, for our debate. Um, I'd like now to uh, move on to our, our next speaker, uh, who is Peter Meisig from Access Now. Um, as I mentioned, Access Now, of course, has done a, a great deal of work uh, on the campaign against internet shutdowns, but since we've already heard about that issue uh, from Florence, uh, Peter, I, I'd like to ask you, um, I know you have a background in uh, business and human rights. 
And uh, one of the trends we've observed uh, is greater self-regulation or self-regulatory efforts, let's say, by, by internet companies, internet intermediaries. Um, what do you see as the key trends in this area? Thank you. Um, yes, I'm uh, Peter Mysek. I'm general counsel at Access Now. Um, I can speak to uh, some, of, some of the work that we've done uh, applying the business and human rights approach, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to the uh, information and communications technology uh, sector. Um, I think first I want to uh, give a little bit uh, of an overview of some of the threats that we see um, and the emerging um, challenges to uh, media independence um, and, the, and the work of uh, independent and, and um, otherwise media workers uh, in 2017. Um, I, th I think it's, it's important to set out that the speed um, and the scale of information um, is, is increasing. Um, it, it will be soon increasing at, at machine speed, um, uh, far surpassing uh, human speed. And um, this has called into question uh, the, uh, the maxim uh, that, that the solution to, to bad speech is more speech. Um, uh, setting that you know, uh, as a framework, I think it, it is important to look at um, what happens online um, and how it may be different from uh, our traditional modes and our, our traditional safeguards um, against uh, disinformation. Um, when we look online, I think uh, that, that disinformation is the right term, um, but I, as I do want to talk more about the infrastructure and the ecosystem um, around the, uh, the pursuit of, of journalism in the digital age, um, in addition to uh, attacks on the, the actual uh, information itself. Um, and a few trends that we see um, are that uh, the credibility of, of journalists are being attacked um, and the capacity uh, to receive uh, the information that they uh, produce um, is also under attack. Um, this, this is as true offline as online. Um, online, uh, I think uh, getting to the infrastructure, um, we see that more and more journalism is being forced uh, uh, to, uh, through intermediaries, um, including the largest internet platforms. Uh, the platforms themselves have welcomed their role um, as distributors and sometimes producers of news in the digital age. They've welcomed this role and um, it, I think it's incumbent um, on, on all of us, including policymakers, to understand um, what the responsibilities uh, come with that role. Um, the platforms uh, are engaging in um, uh, the production of news as well as the um, the dissemination um, and the, the furthering um, by their users of information. Uh, and uh, we have seen, unfortunately, that um, false information, disinformation can be more popular than accurate information online. In the last three months of the uh, U.S. election in 2016, in the last three months, the top 20 uh, false news, or I should say, um, false uh, stories presenting themselves as news um, on Facebook, the top 20 um, false stories outperformed the top 20 um, accurate stories um, in the last three months of the election. So that's in, that's, that's in terms of user engagement. So users um, were, were engaging more, liking, sharing um, these posts. So and I think that's also important because that's not talking about advertising. That's not talking about the, the content around what you see uh, in your feed. It's actually talking about um, the feed itself and what real people were, um, were spreading. Um, so, you know, that's concerning. Um, I think uh, a few other points, uh, looking at impacts on, on female journalists and women engaging online, um, we see that um, one study by an Access Now grantee in India found that 28% of women uh, restricted their online participation um, due to harassment um, and the perceived uh, inaction or inability of intermediaries and uh, government authorities to, to intervene. 36% um, had taken no action um, to, uh, to combat this harassment. Um, other studies have found that, that women generally, uh, journalists find uh, three times the abuse on Twitter as, as men. Um, so these platforms um, are, are um, the infrastructure of journalism in the digital age, and uh, they are, um, it seems, uh, failing to, to understand the particular impacts on uh, vulnerable 
um, users, um, including women journalists. Um, I do, uh, yeah, finally want to talk about um, some of the regulations and the pressure on content platforms. Um, the, the spread of uh, new laws and regulations, as well as um, extra legal measures um, to encourage or coerce platforms to uh, simply uh, censor more content and accounts um, has resulted in over, over censorship. Um, one a stark example this year came in June um, when a new uh, YouTube um, machine learning application uh, looking for content um, of a violent nature uh, ended up taking down hundreds of thousands of videos documenting uh, human rights violations um, and violence in Syria um, over the past decade. Uh, one one uh, organization found that 180 channels, entire channels, had been taken down, um, along with hundreds of thousands of videos, um, and uh, they were struggling uh, to get those um, put back up by the company. So uh, the company was under immense pressure, is under immense pressure, um, YouTube as one of many platforms, uh, to combat what is perceived as, as um, fake news, um, and also to counter violent extremism. Um, unfortunately, though, um, leaving these decisions up to companies um, puts them in the role of judge, jury, and executioner. Um, they're not equipped, um, in most cases, to um, understand how to apply human rights frameworks online, um, and regulators have not passed rights-respecting laws um, uh, and ju uh, giving judges the authority uh, to make those determinations, as, as we suggest. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Peter, for this uh, very uh, informative uh, intervention um, and for bringing some of the, the evidence and concrete cases of phenomena that a lot of people are, are talking about. And it's um, important when we recognize a, a general trend that we, we have some, some evidence that, uh, to support, uh, support those observations. So thank you for that. And, and thank you also for bringing up the issue of online harassment of women journalists. Um, as I mentioned, our original speaker, uh, subject matter expert on that issue was not able to attend. And so I was planning to say a few things, but I think you've, you've uh, raised this issue and you've um, cited some of the evidence. I'd just like to say that uh, this is a, a topic that uh, people are becoming more and more aware of. Uh, of course, we, well, we have the Me Too hashtag um, movement about, about sexual harassment and abuse of women. Uh, IRL, let's say, in, in real life, but also online. Uh, at, at UNESCO um, and within the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists uh, and the issue of impunity, this is one of really the priority areas of action um, that have been identified this year. Uh, the UN Secretary General has an annual report on the safety of journalists, and this year is focused on violence against women journalists. So. Um, uh, that's a topic if any of you are working on this area, uh, if you have, um, have data, studies, uh, ideas, projects on, on this topic, but actually any of them that, that we bring up, please come um, speak to me afterwards and I'd be very happy to, to carry forward the conversation. Uh, okay, moving on, and this is also a good segue to our, our next speaker, Vishaka, from Point of View. Um, could you tell us about, in, in addition to uh, this issue of, of uh, violence uh, against uh, online harassment, uh, women journalists, um, there's also in a persistent problem of gender inequality uh, in and through the media. Um, and I know you are the, uh, are you still the head of the Dynamic Coalition on uh, Gender, gender and, and Internet Governance? governance. Um, you also, Point of View does a lot of work within India. So can you tell me from, from your perspective, uh, what are the key trends in, in gender equality in Internet uh, governance institutions? Or other, if, if you'd like to add others, feel free to modify that question. Okay, but. so let me actually start, you know, I wanted to tell you all a story which sort of talks about freedom of expression both online and offline, media both traditional and new, and how gender sort of cuts through it. So last year, uh, last month, we had a situation where a Bollywood director in India wanted to release a film which was made on a mythical character, a woman who was a princess in, at a particular time, right? The subject of the film, as well as the way it was being made, was actually, um, you know, there was strong opposition to it from a group of people, as well as a group of political actors, who deemed this sort of anti-national. 
for various reasons. The complicated thing was that the woman who was the lead actor in the film, she was threat, they th the, there was a particular politician who threatened to give sort of a huge amount of money as a reward to anybody who would cut off her nose in real life. Yeah. So you see sort of where the freedom of expression conversation is going, first of all. That's the sort of just to begin with, how bizarre it's become that some, a politician can actually in public make a sort of an, this kind of offer, which is totally criminal as far as most of us are concerned, and because of total impunity, of course, get away with it. So basically, this whole conversation continued online and offline. And then there was a small newspaper, which is a newspaper run by rural women in India, which coincidentally won an, a UNESCO award for literacy many years back. And they have an online platform, and they decided to actually cover this entire issue, both online and on their Facebook page. What happened immediately is sort of predictable, uh, is the minute this was on their Facebook page, they were heavily, heavily harassed. But I think the distinction is that while news journalists who covered it were harassed, were sort of, you know, there was a debate on the merits of th making this kind of film or not making this kind of film. In this particular case, all the women journalists were harassed because they were women. So the conversation was not around like, hey, this is what you said about this film, and we don't agree. The conversation was entirely around, you are a woman. How dare you even like think like this, speak like this, et cetera. So I think that is actually the first complication, and it takes us into the realm of internet governance, is I think there is a belief that women sometimes actually don't have a place on the internet. And, you know, this is something that internet governance needs to challenge very, very strongly. The other thing that I wanted to say, which is related to the gender question again, and internet governance, is that at this time and place, just like the journalists of this tiny newspaper who operate with cell phones and they make cell phone videos, any of us who has a cell phone is actually media at some level, right? Like I can actually, be at a particular place where something has happened, I can do a little video on my cell phone, I can put it out on Twitter, it can go viral and then be picked up by mainstream media. So in a sense, I can generate news. So I think we need to sort of start thinking about all of us as media. And I think the Me Too case actually really illustrates how all of us talking about certain things that are not mainstream media priorities can actually have this huge effect to the extent that, you know, time now named the Me Too campaign, it's sort of person of the year. So it can also influence mainstream media, these alternative uh, sort of voices and ways of talking. So I think in this context, it's really important that we think of the internet as a space where people who are traditionally considered marginal or have less power or less privilege are able to speak, are able to amplify our voices, etc. And this again is something that internet governance really has to reckon with. So in closing, I just want to say that when we face threats like this of online violence, harassment, right, it takes away our freedom of expression at a very fundamental level. What happened in this particular case from India and has happened with countless other cases is they just stopped writing about this issue on social media because it was just utterly unacceptable and highly unpleasant to wake up every morning facing rape threats and death threats just because you as a woman journalist have said certain things, right? And you're being attacked on the basis of your gender. So online violence took away their freedom of expression. Online violence takes away our freedom of expression. And so I think the critical aspect for gender and internet governance is that this is some, online violence cannot be seen as a silo any longer by itself, but is critically connected to freedom of expression. 
and something that governments, online platform, internet users, and media must address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bishaka, uh, from, for sharing your point of view. Uh, I, was, I was a little punster. Um, I think, yeah, exactly. Um, the points that you raise are, are very much in line with what UNESCO has been observing and, and um, saying that for some an, an attacks against women journalists that they're often double, double attacks, uh, both because the person is a journalist and because she's a woman. Um, I think you raise a, a very uh, interesting and important observation that an attack, uh, this violence, uh, uh, violence uh, harassment against women journalists and the silencing effect that it has a chilling effect on their expression actually has a, a, an impact on their freedom of expression and also as Florence observed, not only the freedom of expression of those who would like to speak, but actually the freedom of expression uh, or the, free, the, the right to access information and the right to have information of the public as a whole. Um, and so it's, it's a big question now of how to find this balance of what is the right approach to um, uh, allowing marg especially marginalized group, uh, women, minorities, to, ha to be able to express themselves online without having un undue restrictions on freedom of expression, whether they come through, through laws or through technical solutions. Um, and so I think that's, that's an important discussion as we move ahead. Um, now to our, our last uh, subject matter expert. Uh, Thomas Schneider, who is, as I mentioned, one of the, the host country organizers of, of this week. So thank you for all of the work of, uh, that you and your team have, have done uh, in the past year to, to make this internet governance uh, forum happen and, and happen so well. Um, I, you also have served uh, as the, the chair of the government advisory committee, GAC, with an ICANN. Uh, you've been active in the WISIS follow-up and Council of Europe. Um, could you say from, from your perspective a little bit about trends in global internet governance uh, and how, why those matter for, for freedom of expression and media development? I'll, I'll just say we had, um, before, before I give you the, the floor, on Sunday there was uh, a discussion, two, two events led by SEMA, uh, the Center for International Media Assistance, I am International Media Support, Article 19, uh, GFMD, the Global Forum for Media Development, and the, the title was, uh, the battle for freedom of expression online, where are the journalists? And I think there has often been a kind of, that I see at least at UNESCO speaking very personally, that um, those two communities and discussions have not always been linked between internet governance on the one hand and the freedom of expression and media development. So uh, could you please uh, touch on this point? So what's happening globally in internet governance and why does it matter for freedom of expression and media development? Thank you, Rachel, and uh, first of all, thank you, uh, thanks to UNESCO uh, in general for uh, convening this session because um, yeah, we also think that this is a very important issue and it's uh, freedom of expression, safety of journalists is an issue that is important for all regions in the world. Also, uh, uh, again, in Europe and not just in Eastern or South, uh, Southeastern Europe, but actually also in EU countries where we've seen uh, shocking killings uh, of critical journalists lately. So this is really something that uh, can happen in every country. And uh, for Switzerland, this is really something that is very important. And we also uh, strongly support UNESCO's work in, the, in this field. And we've just announced at the general conference in November that will contribute 100,000 Swiss francs to the special fund that you have on freedom of expression, in, uh, impunity, and uh, safety of journalists, because we really think that uh, we all need to join forces and, and work together. Um, listening to, to these discussions and debates, I, I decided to, to uh, uh, slightly change my, my, what I was going to say because we've heard a lot about trends. I think the facts are now, not the, the fake facts, but the true facts are now on the table. What we have not heard that much is what can be done about it. And uh, since I've been working, as you said, with the Council of Europe for, for many years, uh, on, on human rights issues in, in the digital world, on, on, on media issues. Uh, they have produced a number of, of soft law standards and guidance and are still producing uh, this, uh, such standards that I think it, it's actually worth highlighting in uh, two, three minutes uh, some of the standards that I think are important and may be useful guidance, not just for governments on how to do things, but also for media or civil society 
to analyze government's behaviors, to analyze laws about media freedom, safety of journalists, and so on. And uh, so one, one of these elements is uh, a recommendation of the Committee of Ministers from last year on the protection of journalism and safety of journalism that gives some guidance about appropriate legal basis is for prevention, protection, and prosecution of journalists, and also, and this is important because it's controversial in quite a number of countries, about the fact that these, these protections and preventions uh, should also include new media actors, not only traditional journalists, because this is something that uh, is, is still under hot debate in, in, many, in many countries, also in, in, in some areas of Europe. Another one, uh, which is, a, a, I think, a very useful tool, is the, also from last year, the, the recommendation on internet freedom, which uh, not as many do uh, select some particular areas of freedoms that a government mm -hmm. likes. For the ones, it's either freedom of expression. For the other ones, it's maybe privacy. But they don't take the notion of fundamental freedoms as a whole. So this tries really to encompass internet freedom with all its aspects. And the, the interesting thing is that it provides for a set of indicators on how to analyze on what level you are in your country with regard to, to uh, particular inter, uh, aspects of internet freedoms. And for instance, with regard to freedom of expression, uh, you can look at freedom to access the internet, then actually freedom of opinion on the internet, freedom of the media, the legality, legitimacy, and proportionality of restrictions, of censorships, of takedown measures, and so on and so forth. And an important thing when you talk about rights is what remedies do you have to actually fight for your rights or to claim your rights in case they are, they are violated. And some countries, uh, in particular Austria, have started to uh, task independent academics to actually assess the level of internet freedom in their country. And the Austrians have presented at, at the OAC, Council of Europe Conference, in, in, uh, in October, uh, th their work. And I think this is something that can also be picked up by, by other countries, uh, also outside, outside Europe to, on, and, and academics, to see how is my country actually performing on, on internet freedom. Another one is the, uh, something that is uh, there as a draft and will be adopted by the Committee of Ministers uh, next spring, is a recommendation on media pluralism, transparency of media ownership, because that's also a fundamental element uh, which looks into to issues about transparency of ownership, organizations, funding issues, um, regulation about media ownership, concentration, and so on. And uh, the last one is that is in the making, and this is where, where actually probably your question was aiming at. The media, we used to call it in German, the media landscape. The media is not a landscape that is stable. It's an ecosystem that is extremely fast evolving with a number of actors taking on different functions. It's very difficult to assess uh, what kind of services, do they have media character or not, or is it an uh, intermediary service? And this whole notion of responsibility of private sector actors or of, uh, let's say, also responsibility of governments to protect private sector actors, intermediary, from being instrumentalized. We had that discussion also at the high level, uh, at the high level session on democracy on, on, on Tuesday morning. This is something that has been looked at uh, by, uh, and, and there's a recommendation that is there as a draft on the roles and responsibilities of internet intermediaries that shows what are the obligations of governments, of states, with regard to uh, dealing with intermediaries, protecting them from being abused or used, and then also looking towards the private sector. What are their responsibilities, not to uh, restrict freedoms, but actually to protect their users uh, freedoms with regard to privacy, freedom of expression. And I think this is a work that is, uh, there is a recommendation now that's going to be adopted, but this will be ongoing work as the industry evolves, as the system, the ecosystem evolves. This is something we need to constantly look at. Uh, I close it just by alluding to, to future work. We have been looking also into algorithms, into automation in the creation of content, and then uh, the next step, of course, is artificial intelligence. All these things need to be looked at. What are the effects on human rights, positively and negatively, on freedom of expression? Another issue, of course, those who have known me from the ICANN uh, world, we've also looked at uh, human rights implications on, on uh, allowing meaningful names as top-level domain names, for instance, things that seem to be technical at the first stage, but they may actually have implications on freedom of expression, on the right to assembly, and so on and so forth. I'll stop here, okay. and thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas, for all that very, uh, again, I think we've, we, all of the interventions have been uh, actually incredibly um, 
uh, rich and informative. Um, just to re respond uh, briefly before we open up the discussion on, on some of the points raised. Uh, well, first, uh, a great thanks to Switzerland um, on behalf of UNESCO for this generous contribution to our special account uh, on the safety of journalists uh, and freedom of expression. Um, it's so important um, that we, we have the resources to be able to carry out the work. We have a lot of um, technical ex expertise and we have a lot of normative uh, standards, but to operationalize it on the ground um, requires resources, so that's, that's really very appreciated. Um, a point that was also raised by Vishaka and then echoed by Thomas on uh, new media and what, who is a journalist. Uh, that's, that is, is a discussion that is actually still ongoing. It's been ongoing for many years. Um, at UNESCO, the term we use is social media producers. It's a very diplomatic uh, term, let's say, compromise. Uh, social media producers who generate a significant amount of journalism. And so that can include uh, bloggers, citizen journalists. So we see it more as the function of a journalist more than being a professional journalist, having, you don't need a, a license or a diploma to practice journalism. Um, on the indicators mentioned by the, yes, uh, I'll finish and then, I, and then I'll, I'll send it back to you. On the indicators, um, the Council of Europe, very interesting um, initiative. Um, as uh, my colleague Guillerme mentioned, uh, and probably if you've heard anyone from UNESCO speak this week, you've heard about them, the Internet Universality Indicators, and we're in the process of developing them. So I think we can, we can learn a lot from uh, those developed by the Council of Europe and the experience uh, from Austria that, that you mentioned, I'm sure will be informative. Um, we're still using, you said in German, it used to be the term media landscape. I think we're still using that at UNESCO, so maybe <laughs> we're a little end of times. Um, and, and finally, just one, one last point on um, internet intermediaries. Uh, again, it's a, a lot, it depends on the, the language, but we um, at UNESCO like to avoid the term responsibility and rather talk about uh, accountability ethics or uh, depending on who the actor is, but ethics, professional standards, um, because who determines what is what is responsible. Um, so uh, on that point, I think there are many areas of, of overlapping um, visions and, and interests between UNESCO and the Council of Europe, and we work together and we'll look forward to, to taking that forward um, in the coming months and, and years. Um, I saw Florence uh, had wanted to, to add something. Yes, uh, Rachel, actually, uh, if you allow me, I had the Another thing to, to take to talk about the uh, internet shutdown, I thought it was like a talk and actually I, I wanted to talk um, a little bit another minutes about uh, this topic, is this possible? Yeah, definitely. And I, I realized because I, you know, I'd asked everyone to say three minutes and uh, this is perhaps a, not every, <laughs> so it's Bishaka did not either, so it's not entirely a gender equality issue, but I, I realize that that's something in, um, in interviews that happens, this is a phenomenon yeah. that and women, women sick, they answer it. the question quickly, and so then they get many more <laughs> questions. The men <laughs> talk on and on and on, and so they, anyway, so yes, of course, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel, for the comprehension. Actually, I just uh, a few minutes about some topics I think it's important to think. Um, there is a difficult to define uh, the internet shutdown. For a lot of people, um, it just simply is when they cut internet and we don't have internet anymore. But actually, there are a lots of ways of shut have internet shutdowns in very um, very specific case. And I think it's important, and it has been a, a work. To, to, to build a, a consensual definition that could help us to, f to make this mapping of internet shutdown. And what the Keep It On campaign uh, has applied is this one, an intentional disruption of internet or electronic communications, uh, like internet <coughs> intermediary also, uh, rendering them inaccessible or effectively unageable uh, for a specific population or within a location after to access control of the flow of information. And in this case, um, the whole work that the uh, Keep It On campaign has done is to make the classification of how, which kind, how many inch, uh, internet shutdown, what is the, the impact of that. And we see actually that, uh, and maybe we can take the example of ecosystem, um, we have a lot of c actors involved and also a lot of actors that we can um, action to in order to react. When we, uh, in, the, in the campaign, we have uh, built a tool 
to calculate it, the economical impact that an, uh, um, a shutdown causes, and that is very important because uh, when the governments decide to cut internet because they want to avoid a public uh, manifestation or public uh, uh, organization, actually they impact the whole other of economy, and that uh, the, in the possibility to to show to the um, to the business sectors how they can uh, lose about that is also very important. And the last thing, very important also, when we think about a campaign and how we can act, is that uh, we don't, you don't do an uh, internet shutdown just because a government has decided. Uh, the, who is able to realize the shutdown and to um, realize the order that the government is are their internet service providers. And if they want, they also can, could not do. In, uh, in uh, lots of the cases, they just say that it's um, part of the licensing and the contract they have with the government. But they also have to um, protect the human rights. And in, if we involve some of uh, the, the, the principal organization of internet service providers, and, and are able to contract with them that kind of uh, um, involvement to preserve li uh, freedom of expression, we also have the possibility to avoid further uh, shutdown. And that is a, a little bit what we are going to, hap to, to do. We, we are able to, uh, in the campaign, we make like, uh, some contract with some companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and they are speaking through this time through the Global Network Initiative. We also have uh, involved some governments through the Freedom Online Coalition, the United uh, General Assembly has this position on, and, and we see that more or less we are able to, to, to create this fact and to talk about internet shutdown like, like a phenomenon and not just about something very punctually and um, create a, a all the uh, resistant threats that can avoid that f future shutdowns uh, can uh, happen. And I think the IGF uh, in this space in is a very, very important space because we have all the actors involved just to, to go away and to 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 uh, um, make yeah. our campaign grow and in, in, in improve on human rights. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, thanks. And I know I see Vishaka raising your hand, but I'm just conscious that we have, uh, as Guillermo is pointing out to me, we have nine minutes. Uh, we started a little bit late. We, it will be very very short. You have to leave. One lead. One thing. Okay. <laughs> Like, you know what, I was, because we always talk about like freedom of expression and balancing it with silencing expression, I really feel we need a new term. And the term I'm thinking is privilege of expression. And let me just explain very quickly. So, suppose you are someone who's on an internet platform on social media, and you have the power to speak or express in a way that takes away others' freedom of expression. Perhaps what's happening here is that what you are exercising is privilege of expression that's actually taking away my freedom of ex expression. So I think we, that, that's all I pretty much wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Thank yes, you. I didn't want to privilege my expression over your expression. So <laughs> thank you. For, um, Liz, because we're, we are short on time, um, we started a little bit late, so maybe we can go an extra five minutes or, or so. Um, I think we'll take questions. Um, first, do we have anything in the remote, nothing remote moderation? Um, let's take them as a group. Uh, I'll collect them and then uh, point them to the, the appropriate uh, speaker. Um, yes? Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Emilia Givropoulou and I'm a digital policy advisor for the Green CEFA group in the European Parliament. Uh, so I would like to thank you all for your uh, input and I'm really happy that uh, the panel was really diverse with people from all over the, the world because the issue that I'm going to raise is uh, a global issue. It doesn't affect only Europe but it affects us all. Uh, so I hope you excuse me for taking it a little bit further. I really like to thank Claudio uh, and uh, Mr. Misek for uh, actually mentioning this topic uh, before. So this is about the copyright reform that is currently being discussed in the European Union. Uh, it's uh, under discussion in the Parliament right now, but it will enter the trilogue really soon. 
So Article 13 is about upload filters or censorship machines. You can search these uh, terms and you will find something. Um, so this is this uh, provision is a threat to the global, to the internet as we know it today, and it affects us all. So the the, uh, the provision imposes the obligation to platforms to uh, implement uh, upload filters that will filter all our content that is being uploaded. And then the second uh, article that affects journalists as well, and which is uh, one of the topic uh, being discussed here, is Article 11, which is uh, enabling right for news publishers, publishers and not journalists, uh, who, uh, which uh, provision, if implemented as it's now, will cover snippets, will cover hyperlinks. So again, the, the sharing of news and the rights of, of journalists as we know them today and our freedom of expression will not be the same. So I would like your uh, uh, reaction on this uh, and I really wonder what will happen to these indicators that you mentioned uh, if such a law is implemented at the end. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's, um, because we're, we're short on time, that was uh, impo important to explain the context, but let's try to keep to um, a quick, uh, quick questions if possible so we can get everyone And Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm Miss Ching from, uh, from China. Actually, I, uh, I'm a teacher actually in university. Actually, I have a question uh, regarding to the distinguish, the difference between the responsibility and the accountability. Because uh, uh, I think that gentleman talked about, uh, I mean, he's from the Ocon, uh, talked about the responsibility of the private sector. Actually, Rachel corrected to say, we're talking more about accountability and ethics. Because yesterday there was a panel uh, which is about ICOM. And uh, basically they reject the idea ICOM will step forward to intervene if there's uh, any request from the ISP to say, can you give me any advice? Should I take down the content, you know? And ICOM actually they indicated that they were not doing that. So I just want to, you know, clarify what's the difference between the responsibility of the private actor and the accountability. Are we talking about dual process or the court order or are we talking about uh, sub substantive guidance? Okay, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. The others, uh, I see Andrea from, from ICANN, maybe he'll answer that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> I wasn't really answering this question, but I can come um, speak with you after. I have uh, a question for you as an organizer and a question to one of the speakers. Um, why there are no um, internet platforms on the panel? Did you invite them? Did you consider um, having them online? Or uh, and if they reply yes or no? And then, uh, and then to Thomas, you, you defined um, the risk of internet platform to be abused. Um, can you argument on that? My, my take is that they are not being abused since their business model um, is based on advertisement. And if you look at the fake news scandals in the US elections, well, they, they were charging um, for those news that then became viral. And uh, I think one point that hasn't been addressed here is uh, as a bit that is the business models of the internet media platform intermediaries and whether we should look at that and the impact it has on freedom of expression and the discussion that we had so far. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you can take uh, one last question and then uh, some quick responses and a sum up by our uh, super special reporter. Yes, go ahead. Okay, my name is Angela. I'm from Article 19, Eastern Africa. And uh, I have a concern or a question, you can take it either way. And that is on the question of definition of who is a journalist. Uh, so part of my work, I try to monitor the situation in Eastern Africa and countries are yet to actually embrace the functional approach to who is a journalist. We still have laws asking journalists to register before they practice. We still have media councils which are trying to make even the requirements of being a journalist stricter. So my question is, is the approach of the functional uh, definition even going to work when you have domestic legislations that are trying to maintain the strict uh, divisions between who is a journalist and who is not? Thank you. 
Yes, uh, thank you for that very important question. Um, I see that I believe Thomas needs to leave soon, so I'll... I'll Oh, you were just too eager. You, you were privileging your expression over someone else. No. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, just kidding. Um, no, so we, uh, just to try to summarize the, the questions, um, from what I heard, we had a question about uh, copyright reform uh, in the, uh, being discussed in the European Parliament and what impact that might have on news and journalism. So that's one. We had one from what is the difference between responsibility and accountability. Uh, a third question about uh, why are the internet platforms not here in the, um, and is it fair to say that they're being abused or is it actually what's happening with the so-called fake news, um, a not an inevitable uh, result of the way that these businesses are, are structured. And then fourth, um, about this definition of journalists, what do you do when international uh, standards conflict with national laws? I think that's what that's what I picked up. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly answer a couple of them that I, I can answer, and then I'll pass on to the, the speakers. Um, on uh, it, the organization of this session, um, we did invite uh, one of the companies. Um, uh, I don't want to name and shame. That's not the that's not the UN way. But um, the response was from the, this platform was we're not looking for a platform. <laughs> And they, I think uh, maybe it's a difference of approach that they, I, my understanding is want more to listen and understand what the debate is and not to be speaking in so many sessions. So uh, it's a shame it would have been a, a very valuable input in this conversation. Um, and I hope that in future events we'll, we'll be able to include them uh, again as we have in the past. Uh, on response, just to clarify the responsibility and account, and maybe someone else wants to answer, but um, the point from UNESCO, I think as, as was raised by this, um, uh, in this question, is that uh, it can be um, uh, vague or have multiple meanings to say responsible. And so I think in the context of what Thomas was mentioning, it's maybe liability, uh, legal liability, and that would be perhaps a more precise word. And other in the context of ICANN, it's more the, all the discussions around accountability and the uh, cross-community working group on accountability, is various work streams. So I think it is important to, to be precise. Um, I will now, uh, and just definition from UNESCO's perspective that uh, our, what we try to do is to assist member states in bringing their national laws and policies in line with international standards. And of course it takes time and it takes political will, but that, that is our hope. Um, and we'd be happy to, to look at this case uh, in Eastern Africa. Um, Reader, I know, okay, Thomas, uh, you would like to respond on a couple of points? Yep. Yes, thank you. Just, just briefly to, to a number of questions. Um, well, there are different aspects. One is a legal liability. Another one is accountability that is maybe more linked to, to transparency. Responsibility is maybe a broader term. There's also the term of duty, of duty of care. But in the end, it goes to what, to what, what uh, also uh, Andrea's question was. In some countries, um, the governments or the laws ask or the political pressure asks intermediaries or platform providers to take decisions on what is legal or not, what needs to be taken down, what needs to be censored. And this is what I mean with, with abuse, that decisions are delegated to private sector access that should be taken by governments or by laws or by courts implementing or interpreting uh, 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 laws. And, and this, is, this is the danger. Also the question of monitoring content or filtering content when, when uploaded or when, when it's up there. This is a huge debate and there we need to be very careful what are the, the duties, whether they are legal or just real duties because of political pressure of private sector actors. This, this is one element. And just quickly, if I may, to the uh, question about def defining journalists. The Council of Europe already seven years ago developed a new notion of media with a graduated and differentiated approach because you have all level of media actors. A blogger is also a media actor, but he ha may have less responsibility. He may benefit from less protection, but he may still benefit from protection according to the function that he has in, in, in the media system. I'm happy to talk to you about this offline because that may help you uh, as a guiding system. It's not just you're a journalist, yes or no, but you may have media functions, but they may be different and, and with different responsibilities and different rights. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would like to react to our fellows uh, uh, point here about responsibility and accountability. And I think it, c it can also be taken as a cultural 
uh, slash language issue. Because in, in Portuguese, for example, responsibility is part of the legal expression. So it's, it's, it's we might have a different uh, organization here. Mm -hmm. Responsibility, liability, and accountability are a very rich, broad range of terms that in English that we don't have, for example, in Portuguese, in exact correspondence. And one sentence to react to what Emilia uh, put about the, the automation of control, it depends on the maturity of the tool and a very short take, are they ready to take a decision on the content? Might take two letters, no. Are they ready to ready us? Is, 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 are they ready or should they be used to, uh, to assist us in moderating? Of course, the problem is digital scale. The answer is not in paperwork or in analog work. So they have to be tools. They can take a decision, whether it be in content for intellectual property, whether it is automating the control of what is true. Thank you. I think uh, Guillerme would like to say a few words. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of points that are, uh, that are relevant for us. I mean, as, as, as a UN agency, in terms of definitions, of course, we need to follow what are uh, in the international instruments. So regarding, for instance, the definition of journalists, this very house, the Human Rights Council, has issued a definition of journalists, and as far as a UN Secretariat, we are following that particular uh, definition of journalists. Uh, and in other regions of the world, for instance, the International, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has a very famous consultative opinion that is now uh, Inter-American jurisprudence, uh, saying that uh, journalists does not requi require license to exercise journalism. So I think it's important also uh, to discuss those issues, taking into account the international national jurisprudence we already have on international documents uh, regarding those uh, several issues. Um, uh, just to, to add two elements on the trends that were uh, raised by Thomas as part of the tools uh, but not as the trend and I just wanted to underline that. Uh, one of the things we have identified in the trends both in new media and uh, so-called traditional media or whatever we want to make this historical difference, it's about concentration of ownership. And of course, this impacts not only pluralism, but also levels of independence. So this is an issue that we need to keep discussing and uh, finding the, the different tools uh, to, and well, this very week we have on the front, front pages of all the newspapers and, uh, and, and different uh, media, uh, a very big case of media concentration uh, in US. Uh, and, and the other element on the safety side that we didn't raise here, but also it's among our concerns, uh, is, is the amount of journalists that are being requested by different regulators and even judges to reveal their sources of information. And so this is also very important to be discussed uh, under the elements of threats uh, to uh, the safety of the entire uh, system of communications and information. Ah, thank you, Jeremy. I, I just got a tap on the shoulder that uh, the next session will soon be beginning. I know we can maybe continue this conversation over lunch. Uh, I personally will be looking for some pasta in the serpent bar. Um, Chris, I know you were going to give us your, your report, and I'm afraid we, it looks like we don't have time. I encourage everyone, it will be posted online. Chris is going to send it in half an hour. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but it will be on the IGF website. We'll also have an article uh, on the UNESCO website about this event. Um, which we'll try to summarize the main points for you. So thank you again to our panelists and to uh, the, everyone here in this room for your engaging uh, comments and questions uh, and look forward to, to speaking again soon.